My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. Number one is you can go and write a brief review on iTunes, or number two, you can simply go and make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today my guest with the answers will be DJ McClellan, who is most recently the author of an interesting book about cryonics titled Frozen to Life, a personal mortality experiment. So hi, hi DJ, I'm very happy to have you finally on my show. Hi Nicola, great to be on the show. Thank you for inviting me on. Fantastic. So DJ, can you perhaps introduce yourself in a couple of words? Yeah, um, I guess I'm a, I'm a futurist of sorts. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in human emotions and the way that emotions lead us forward in transhumanism. And uh, more recently, I'm an author. I've been, I've been blogging for quite a few years. I have a blog called extravolution.com. And uh, about four years ago, I decided that I, I needed to write this book, Frozen to Life. I felt that it was bursting out of me and I just had to get it down. I think I had a lot, I felt like I had a lot to explain to a lot of people and, uh, and writing a book was really the only way to do it. That's, that's, that's very interesting. So uh, let me perhaps start by asking you this then. What is cryonics for you and how did you get interested in it and why? Um, I think, first of all, I'm a very sort of practical, pragmatic person. And uh, when I first heard of cryonics, it, it didn't come as a, as a shock to me in the same way that it does to other people. I think I first heard about cryonics around 2003 in a newspaper article. And to me, it just seemed like a, a sensible, pragmatic thing to do. I guess because I don't have any uh, spiritual beliefs, there was no blockage there to, to considering the idea. So I just thought it was an interesting um, practical idea. It was only later on that I actually decided to, to pursue it for myself, but I didn't think there was anything odd about uh, somebody choosing to be cryopreserved uh, after their death. I find it's always helpful to define the things that we talk about on my show. So let's just throw in your personal definition of cryonics. Okay. Um, cryonics is the idea of preserving people at the highest possible resolution um, in the hope that we might be able to return them to some living state at some future time using whatever technology we have available. Um, as, I, as I wrote in an article recently, actually one for your website, it's a kind of, it's a type of time travel. If you, if you look at uh, um, vitrification as putting somebody into a glass state, it's a glass state time travel. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was pushing for because uh, I have to say, and one of the reasons, of course, that I decided to invite you on my show is because you wrote this absolutely fabulous uh, guest blog article for my blog, which is called Cryonics, A Glass State Time Travel. And I thought that that's a very interesting, unique, original way to define it, but also very accurate, uh, which, which is not easy to have both a unique way of, of, of saying something as well as it being so accurate. So... Um, I want to congratulate you for that. A and then let me ask you, so why write a book about it? Why don't you just make the decision, uh, join a, a cryonics organization of your own choice and then just move on with your life and keep on writing books on other topics? Mm. Well, I think it's partly to do with, with family. I, I have a large family. I've got four brothers and a sister and both my parents. I'm fortunate that both my parents are still alive and they're all intelligent people and they had different questions and they kept asking me about this but I still had this nagging feeling no matter how many conversations we had we weren't really getting to the to the nub of this thing and I felt that I really needed to take the time to to get the science down properly to explain it to them but also um, because we're all individuals although although we grew up together you don't see directly inside somebody else's head. They, I don't think they understood the extent to which um, I was a fearful child and this 
this thing about death was building up in me for a long, long time, and I, that I wanted to try and do something practical about it. Because as, as I say, I am practical and pragmatic, but I'm also emotional. I'm very much in love with life. And I, I wanted to kind of try and marry those two elements together, uh, the, the, the emotion and my feeling about my, my life and, and my wife and my family, but also that kind of pragmatic aspect. Like how, can we, how can we make this persist? How can we keep this wonderful thing that we have uh, going for, for longer without seeing it all wither away and die? Mm -hmm. So th there's a couple of interesting thoughts that I want to grab there. So first of all, does that mean that your book is aimed at your family? Or in other words, who is this book for? Is it for your family only? Mm. It, it started out that way, but then it turned in, into something else. Um, when, when I started writing it, um, I hadn't even decided whether I was going to publish it or not at the end of the exercise. But it just developed into something else. When I started realizing... Um, how in depth I was going to have to get on the subject of cryonics as I wrote it. I thought um, this could be interesting for a, a transhumanist audience. And then I saw a way of, of interweaving the, 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 the personal story, the human story with the, with the science. And then I thought, well, maybe this could appeal to uh, more general readers as well and, and try to bring them into the idea of cryonics to try and humanize the subject without without skimping on the science still leaves the science the technical stuff in there that was vitally important to me but but humanize the subject so so that the general reader isn't going to see um cryonicists as a very different breed of people somehow who have these strange ideas uh, this is something that we can all do i wanted to get across the idea that, that cryonics is something that's accessible to everybody and should be that's what we should be about it's not an exclusive club. Exactly right. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why it did grab my attention as it did, and, and I enjoyed it very much. So let me ask you then, what's your book's thesis, or if you have one? Well, that's kind of a tough question. I guess the thesis behind it is that cryonics is something that everybody should give some consideration to, um, but also that there's the self is something that everybody needs to give consideration to. The two things are very much bound together. You have to uh, develop a clear idea in your mind of what you think you are. And when you've got that pinned down, you can decide what you can do with that. And I, I find that idea absolutely fascinating. I, I find the idea of discovering what we are and the way I think of it is a, as, a, as a type of pattern. And I guess in the way that Ray Kurzweil does, I'm a, I'm a kind of patternist. Um, and once you have that idea in your head, and it's a very difficult idea to, to hold in your mind, it's something that keeps collapsing in your mind because the ego keeps kicking in and collapsing that idea. But I think if you can get that idea clear in your mind, it becomes a wonderful thing that you can then use. So the thesis, I guess, is that cryonics is very much connected to the idea of the ego and the self, as well as in preserving the things that we love and care about. When you said you're kind of a patternist, what kind of pattern are you referring to? Are you referring to our sort of neurological brain patterns of our sort of neurons or the neural mapping and the connections of all the synapses, etc. Yes, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm talking about the way that the mind um, supervenes on the architecture of the brain. This, it's uh, like an emergent pattern that's, that's running on the architecture of the brain. And that's the pattern. Once you recognize it as a pattern, although it's an incredibly complex one and we don't know how to map it exactly and we, we certainly don't know how to copy it or upload it yet, um, I think it has potential. Once you recognize it as a potential, all the other possibilities uh, stem from that realization. Mm -hmm. What was the kind of research you had to do in preparation of writing this book? Yeah. 
just just reading the, the the scientific papers that were related to it, finding out more about Alcor's procedures, making sure that I was getting those those down correctly. I really didn't want to to slip up with the with the technical side of the book. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you chose Alcor instead of uh, let's say the Cryonics Institute? Yes, yeah, I'm I'm a signed up Alcor member, um, and I think the decision about that happened um, around about 2007, I think it was, I signed up for Alcor. And just at, at the time, my research at that time led me to think, it, it, it was a lot to do with the fact that Alcor offered neural preservation. Now, so I'm signed up for neural preservation. I just really didn't see the point of, of trying to preserve entire bodies. It seems unduly wasteful and res resource intensive. This pattern that I'm talking about, <laughs> This pattern that I'm talking about runs on the brain, and uh, so the brain's the, port the important part to preserve. It just didn't seem to me to to, to be worth um, all the extra technical difficulty of, of preserving an entire body. Let me ask you this though: uh, you started by saying how important it was uh, to have this conversation with other people, especially with your own family, and to sort of explain sort of your rationale behind it. Has anyone else joined in signing up for cryopreservation after and or together with you? For example, either be it your wife, your siblings, or your parents? No, not yet. But I consider it a long game. It's like everything else to do with cryonics. It's a, it's a long game. And my wife's attitudes, although she was always very supportive since reading the book, uh, she's actually read it three times now, she's much, much more open to these kind of ideas. And um, I'm not sure that she would consider signing up for, for cryopreservation because she's quite fatalistic in a funny sort of way. But um, it has certainly opened up her mind to the possibility. Um, same goes for some other members of my family, but they're, they're all very different people and, and they, have, they have quite different attitudes to it. Some supportive, some not so supportive. Um, I also have friends who are seriously considering the idea now. I mean, the money thing seems to be a big barrier for a lot of people. I've got one particular friend who, um, who says that, yes, he would sign up for, for cryopreservation if it was a cheaper option. But they, 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 So let me just answer that. So there are cheaper options provided by the Cryonics Institute uh, near, near uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, yes. where a cryopreservation is about less than half actually of the neuropreservation at Alcor. So they're looking at about, let's say, thirty, thirty-five to $40,000. Um, whereas neuropreservation in Alcor at the moment starts at about 80000 I think. Um, so that's definitely a cheaper option for your friends to consider. But what I'm interested here most of all is, is this. So you wrote this, in my opinion, very good book. But why is it that the people closest to you are still struggling with the idea? So in other words, it has not translated yet into action. And I want to see if there's a lesson from this experience into the sort of global outcome where very few people have actually signed up for cryonics. Way too few, in my opinion. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. And... Um, that would change the whole dynamic and it would bring the cost down and all the other good things that go along with that. Um, per perhaps it's something to do with the, the dynamic within my family. We're all uh, individuals and I don't think any of us likes to be told what or how to think. And uh, But I guess, you know, that's, that, that's, that's always a stumbling block. You're, you're talking about such an ingrained custom that it that that it's an incredibly difficult habit to break that the way people think in that customary way of what happens when somebody dies and also there's the added dynamic that that i come from quite a religious part of the world not in the sense that um, america is religious not in that kind of evangelist way but in a very reserved presbyterian way my family aren't like that but that's the kind of culture if you like that we've we've come come from tell us a little bit more about where, where you come from that was, would be interesting and relevant uh well i live in in, in the isle of sky which is a 
uh, a fairly large island uh, on the northwest coast of, of Scotland. Um, the the weather's pretty foul. We get at this time of year we've got uh, a huge Atlantic squalls coming in, um, but it's also a very beautiful island. Uh, lots of mountains. The, the Coolin Mountain Range, which is very famous worldwide, very popular with client with with climbers who come to fall off it quite often, um, <laughs> and. It's a place that I always thought I would leave. I, I, I grew up here, I went to high school here, and I always thought it would get, would get away because of the, the conservatism of the place and because that religious element was still quite strong. Um, but somehow it just kind of held me here. And now I think there's interesting con contradictions about being here and and living this kind of connected lifestyle and considering ideas like cryonics and transhumanism, but still being here, um, still having these other, other cultural connections, I guess. Um, I'd, I'm not that strongly connected to the culture of here. The, the Gaelic language, the Scottish Gaelic language still exists here, although the number of, 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 of speakers Scotland-wide is, is only in the tens of thousands. That language, um, there's there's still fluent speakers of that language here, and um, a lot of those speakers connect the language very directly with the Presbyterian religion of the place. So those things are bound together, and they are also bound up in the the agricultural heritage of the place. So those are the kinds of things that I tend to kind of push away because I'm uh, I'm I'm so interested in the future that a lot of the time I seem to be kind of pushing against that that past but that's interesting that 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 is an interesting dynamic i think yeah and you actually go into depth of of sort of sharing that dynamic in the book uh from your upbringing and and the birth of your siblings uh, uh and sort of going through the high school experience your bullying that you experienced there and then becoming a member of a sort of a hard rock rock and roll band and, and all the things that come along that uh, let me ask you this though. So are you considering yourself to be a transhumanist then? Yeah, that, that's a difficult question too, because I'm certainly a, a techno progressive. Um, and I suppose, yes, I am a transhumanist. The transhumanism angle, I think has come out of my, my writing. I guess I was a techno progressive for a long time in, in that I was interested in technology in the future, but I think it was only when I started writing it down and that feeling that that I got from putting those thoughts down, a kind of um, soaring, optimistic kind of vision of how the future could be. I guess that kind of marks me out as, as, a, as a transhumanist. It's the, it's the emotional side um, that's revealed the transhumanism to me, if you like. As well as the idea that we can transcend the biological limitations. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's um, transcending limitations is 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 very important to me. Obviously, uh, if people don't want to change and don't want to be fixed, if you like, James Hughes talks quite a lot about this. Then that's absolutely fine. But it's it's about having the liberty to choose what we want to be. I think that's that's incredibly important. And there's actually a strong tradition of that in, in Scotland, the, um, the Enlightenment tradition, I think, of uh, uh, egalitarianism. So I think I'm definitely an egalitarian transhumanist rather than an individualistic one. I want... I want to take everybody with me. You know, I want, I want us all to go along into this, this better future. Mm -hmm. That's why you tend to quote uh, James Hughes a lot more than Max Moore, for example. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I have, I have a lot of time for for both uh, James and Max and their their writing. But and I and I think that Max is is view has kind of softened a lot. But I, I found it. It has. Yeah, I found it hard to 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 find so much in common with the kind of older extropian version of, of trans, transhumanism. And then when I started reading James Hughes and the way he connected it into Buddhism and those kind of ideas, I, I found that, that more appealing. Yeah, I, I myself tend to gravitate a lot to, uh, in, in that direction too, without under sort of mining or underappreciating the 
importance of Max Moore's writings for transhumanism in general. Yes, of course. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the fear of death. Mm. Right? You said uh, your family didn't realize how fearful you were as a child, and especially the fear of death and all that. How important and or relevant or motivating was that emotional charge into one researching cryonics and two writing a book like this? Well, I'm not sure when when you're when you're writing a book, when you're actually putting it down, I was always sick and guessing myself, am I turning this fear into a narrative for the sake of of telling a story or was I really always that that fearful and yeah I think on balance I would say that that I was pretty fearful um, and, and still am quite afraid of death and have been throughout my life but that has been a motivate a motivator it's 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 pushed me in the direction of understanding life and death and in the direction of 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 um, of choosing cryonics um, I'm not saying that 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 everybody should be fearful of death. That's not going to be a motivator for everybody. That's for for some people that might push them in a completely different direction. But for me, it's kind of, I think it's kind of brought me to here, and uh, I'm less fearful of death now. Now that I've actually investigated it more and discussed it with people more, I don't. I don't worry about it so much. Now, you could say that's because I'm signed up for cryonics, so that's fine. I don't have to worry about it so much. I have this kind of glimmer of hope of a of a continued future, but it's it's more than that. I think it's about understanding the self and understanding the the tenuousness of self, if you like, and uh, and actually how although we are so different from anything else we know of in the universe how we are still very much part of it and bound into it. And I think you have to avoid like turning that into a kind of physics related religion, if you like, you've got to, you've got to tread very carefully with that kind of stuff. But I do feel more connected to my world and my universe, having, having looked into these subjects. Well, what about the idea that, uh, or, or the criticism rather, that some may level it at you, which is often the case uh, for people who defend cryonics, in saying that uh, cryonics is like the straw, the last straw of, of a drowning man trying to grasp at anything in order to delay and or avoid the inevitability of death. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that's 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 a fair criticism. That's a valid criticism. And I've been uh, critical of um, religionists, religious people for, for doing just that, clutching at this um, metaphysical straw of, uh, of an, of an afterlife, but exactly right. So people say, you know, some people choose God, whether it's Catholicism or, you know, uh, Islam or whatever, and you just replace that with cryonics. And, and how is that any different? Yeah. Well, cryonics is very much not a religion. It's 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 a it's a practical approach to life. It's saying, well, you know, if if I if I don't do anything practical about this situation that I'm going to die, my death is absolutely assured. If I take this practical measure, then the chance of my survival is non-zero. Um, we the the chances the chances that I'll be able to go on are improved by, but only if by an absolutely tiny fraction, but that, that fraction is enough. It's enough. I mean, what have you got to lose? Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, let me ask you this. Have you, or, or what are in your view, uh, given the research that you did for your book, sort of the most important recent, perhaps, developments in cryonics? Mm. Um, I think that vitrification is incredibly important because uh, the, the ice crystals in, in blood plasma were a huge problem. Now, they still are a problem, but the, the fact that we're getting to a situation now where we can we can start to to deal with the problem of, of rupturing cells is incredibly important. But we need to start looking at 
what we're actually getting out of the, the cryopreservation process. What, what's the fidelity of what we're getting? And, and I think um, yeah, Ken Hayworth has been very kind of critical of, of Alcor's procedures in that, in that regard. I understand that he used to be an Alcor member. And um, I think, um, so the, 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 the technique that, that Ken Hayworth is experimenting with um, is an interesting avenue. I think, I think that that might be something um, that perhaps Alcor can look at at some point in the future. Um, but it's, it's more of a kind of chemo cryo fixation. Chemical brain preservation. That's what uh, Ken Hayworth is talking about. Now, to, to be more specific, however, uh, his argument goes along something like this, because I've interviewed him on my show. We know that at the small level, or, or he claims that we know that at the smallest level, chemical brain preservation is a lot better at actually preserving the tissue and or the neurons r rather than uh, cryonics. The problem that chemical brain preservation has at this m moment is scaling it up. Yeah. So that's why the, the, actually the, the Chemical Brain Preservation Foundation has a, a, an award for research of uh, chemically preserving uh, hopefully the brain of a mouse uh, and so on, and we're not quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, human brains are considerably larger, so that that creates, you know, perhaps an order of magnitude kind of a difference uh, from scaling up from a from a from a from a mouse brain. And actually, right now we're very far away even from that. Yes. So at at least at this moment, uh, I think cryonics for larger objects like human brains. I think is is the best uh, sort of non-zero chance, despite of its yes. issues and, and and problems. Yes, I agree. Uh, but yeah, just like you, I'm following uh, the development in that field of of chemical brain preservation myself too. Let me go back to the issue of other people close to us not embracing cryopreservation. So you you did mention that your your wife is kind of probably fatalistic in a funny way. Yeah. I personally had a period of uh, of maybe a couple of years trying to convince my wife to join me. And uh, in the beginning, she started off as being sort of totally creeped out by the possibility of being frozen. And after a couple of years and me doing a, a number of video sort of tours of both Alcor and the Cryonics Institute and visiting and talking to the people and reading a few books, now she's actually ready to sign up with me in February. So we're going to Alcor in, in Arizona in February and we're going to both join. And to, to be honest, for me, that was the reason why I didn't join a few years ago is because I wanted to keep that conversation open. I wanted to keep that conversation ongoing because I was afraid that if I already were to sign up, I would have much less incentives to kind of uh, keep that conversation open. So tell me a little bit about your decision not to do something like this and about your wife's ongoing resistance, despite the fact that she's read your book three times. I don't know. It's hard to say. There's, there's, there's a word in, in the Scots language. I don't know if there's, yeah, I guess there's a, an equivalent in other languages, but there's this word thrown, which is just basically means um, a certain kind of stubbornness and I don't know if it's a if it's a Scottish thing or a Highland thing, but you you come across quite a lot of people in this country who are just kind of thrown about things. They're just they they know their own minds in a certain kind of way, and they just want to to stick to that. And you know, I kind of respect that on one level. It's 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 good if people kind of know their own minds and they know what they care about to a certain extent. But at the same time, it can be a kind of wall of resistance. Now, I'm not saying that my wife is a really thrown person. She's not. She's very um, open-minded and caring and gentle person. But um, I think that, that people just find it very hard to be told that there might be another way of doing things. If you've gone your whole life thinking about um, maybe what your parents have done, you're thinking, um, I know but the way my life goes, the story of the way my life goes is that when I die, I'm going to be cremated and my ashes are going to be spread here. This um, 
cryonics thing. It's like it's like a discontinuity in your worldview. It's an ontological shock. It it gets right in your face and says, "There's something here that you just haven't considered." Your the the your narrative of your life um, has kind of um, completely missed something, and I th I think that's that's quite difficult for 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 some people to take in and i think we have to tread quite carefully with that in some ways um and we just have to be patient um i am not that patient a person myself so i just decided i was going to do this thing i can be impulsive sometimes i signed up for cryonics but i always had this feeling that i had time that i had time i could to, to to convince other people and talk it through and and now having written the book um and i have some speaking engagements and things i can use those to just keep keep going and keep going i mean the whole ethos of 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 transhumanists and people who are signed up for cryonics is about extending time we don't have to be um everything within this one lifetime we can extend that out and 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 we can have all other kinds of possibilities come to pass in our extended lives so i think we just need to we need to be patient and and, and i i do think that in time um these things will 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 come to people but um you know whether it comes to my wife and to my family in time i just don't know i really i really hope so and i'll certainly keep making the case and, and trying to convince them because the reason that i keep pushing this actually is, is 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 precisely that and scaling up that kind of effort because if you look at the history of cryonics maybe since uh, let's say the, the late 1960s since the first cryopreservations and there's been a very very kind of shockingly in my opinion slow pace of adoption yeah there's been a little bit of an improvement in the last couple of years by the way yes yes i've been following that which is very nice but still overall globally speaking it's absolutely negligible and that to me that's mind-boggling and, and and especially how hard and and so I'm kind of struggling with you uh, right now because uh, with, with the same issues that you're struggling with, I mean, is because I'm trying to convince my wife's family now to join us, uh, her mom, her dad, and, and her siblings and stuff like that. So, and, and it's kind of like not easy and people tend to fluctuate. One day, for example, her mom would say, okay, okay, maybe I'll do it. And then on another day she says, no, 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 absolutely not. I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, and and to me it's it's so frustrating i'm i'm kind of patient but not all, not patient really just kind of like you so i have my better days and worse days and to me it's, it's just frustrating sometimes that that so few people are actually willing to take this seriously and and consider doing it yes i i i feel the same way and but I really do think that that it's that it's uh, it's just a, a matter of time. I do think that we're 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 going to get to a point where um, where interest in cryonics and and uh, membership of Alcor and Cryonics Institute is really going to is really going to take off. Um, you, but you, I mean, you just have to look at the when you if you if you read any of the comments on um, cryonic stories in in the in the newspapers and the online press you 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 see so many so many negative comments and so many comments about uh selfishness and what what who do these people think they are why do they think why do they think that they're they're so special that they deserve this as as if as if we have to deserve this as if there's some it's a kind of religious idea as well that there's some overall arbiter deciding our worth and it hasn't been decided um, by fiat or whatever that um, that we are the people who are worthy of this of this thing of this extra chance of life. Now it's a, it's a very strange, conflicted kind of argument because on one hand you're saying that they're um, saying that this thing is never going to work, and then on the other hand saying that 
um, these aren't the people who deserve it if it does work. It, it doesn't make it doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not quite sure how we get there. I think um, the kind of gentle pressure and and trying to humanize it is my angle. Is trying trying to turn it into real stories of real people. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't help our case if we are. Uh, when, when people are too kind of aloof about these ideas, I don't think it helps our case very much. We we have to get across the importance of um, of of the love in this decision. What we're we're trying to do. Um, I, I love that quote by Riva Melissa Tez: "The battle we face is love over entropy." She said in in one of the articles she wrote, and I think that's that's incredibly true. We know that the that the universe is is tending towards chaos and that everything will will eventually die and we are these eddies of order within this when that within this chaos and and love helps us to maintain ourselves and and the people we care about as these eddies of order and so so, so love can be a very powerful force in this entropic universe i think and and, and i think uh you actually take a lot of time and effort into going through a diversity and a variety of, of arguments uh, in support or, or against cryonics and, and in addressing those. Uh, but, but I think there's, there's another sort of a personal feature that, that may kind of push the two of us, for example, together in our kind of attitude of embracing be it cryonics or something else. And I want to I want to read this uh, uh, as a little quote from your book where you say, I don't do acceptance very well, particularly when it comes to the big issues. People like me are not protesting the implacable passage of time or the immutable laws of the universe, but we are striving for greater freedom from the bonds of our accidental nature. And I have to say that we do have this kind of kinship and, and I think it takes maybe perhaps that kind of a character to sort of commit to or or, or embrace the experiment of, of cryonics. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the experiment aspect of it is is very important to me. It's it's kind of, I mean, you could see something like cryonics as high-level life hacking in a way. Um, it's the ultimate kind of life hacking, really, potentially. Um, but we have to we have to treat life as a, as as an experiment, I think, because um, what else is it if it's not an experiment? If we're not pushing the boundaries with it, if we're not if we're not really trying. But I I I think that people who treat life as an experiment are actually um, very much in in the in the minority. Uh, I think that most people just tend to kind of cruise through life as comfortably as they can. And don't get me wrong, I like to be comfortable. I I um, enjoy spending time with 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 my loved ones and just doing the nice things that everybody else likes to do. I'm not sitting there tearing myself to bits about these issues all the time. Although I certainly seem to be when I'm writing. Um, but. Um, beyond that, on 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 the on the larger scale, I think we have to think about it as an experiment, um, and it's such a such a small, such a short uh, testing ground that we have available to us. I think we have to try and make good use of it. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, so so let me ask you a little bit about more about sort of the the autobiographical features uh, of your book because it's very very autobiographical. And let me read another quote where you kind of explain why that's the case or, or why you decided to, to kind of put it into this kind of a format or, or approach where you say, I, the case study of this book, need to reveal my personality in as honest a way as I can so that you, the reader, can make judgments about my state of mind. Yes. So t tell us a little bit more about that. Why going so deeply into your sort of birth, your whole adolescence, all the way through high school, 
uh, the first dates, the bullying that you've experienced, your own personal emotional states along the way, your fear of death, all those things. How are they relevant to cryonics? I think I think they're relevant because um, I wanted to connect cryonics to the normal human experience because although I know that I had this um, sort of fearful approach to life and this kind of dark glee, I've called it in the book, in my mind, um, my life story isn't that different to anybody else's apart from that it seems to have in the views of many this kind of discontinuity in it where I sign up for cryonics but I wanted to get across using the autobiographical stuff that this wasn't a discontinuity and isn't a discontinuity in anybody's life it's it comes out of the normal process of living it's a decision that maybe takes um, time to educate yourself about and time to get to and people can come to it from all diff all sorts of different directions and all sorts of different lives but that it's not it's not a rub, rupture in the fabric of space time it's just an approach to custom and um about how we can change customs really um and why should it be so hard for human beings to consider changing their customs it's almost as if they forget that customs are in a constant state of flux and have have changed so much over um thousands of years even over over decades it seems really odd that they seem to believe that we should retain these same old uh, death customs that we've had for for a few hundred years um, i find that very odd so so yeah again it's about humanizing cryonics and saying that this is a decision that is reached through the normal process of living it it's not about some kind of epiphany in the in the sort of religious sense where you suddenly have an aha moment or you suddenly have a, a total nervous breakdown. It's, it's part of the process of living and coming to realize that, um, that life is, uh, life is something that you can look at in a different way you, that you can look at life as a pattern and you can look at ways of, of trying to preserve it. But, I guess above all that you can you can break free of customs. You can you can leave them behind. You can make your own. Um, you can you can become part of a completely different culture, which in a sense is what I've done um, by learning about transhumanism, learning about cryonics, and and through the the medium of the internet, you know I've been able to connect into a completely different culture which just wasn't available to me when i was a child and to a teenager and, and that that in itself is a is a wonderful thing mm -hmm. and and you're very sort of upfront and honest and straightforward about your own personal flaws in the book too by the way so so for example uh you share with us in in sort of chapter eight that healthy living that's a quote by the way healthy living and I have an, uh, where you talk about your bad habits, sort of. You, you say, healthy living, and I have an, an, an uneasy relationship. I do things that are supposedly bad for me. I drink, I don't exercise much, I eat lots of fat and red meat. Mm -hmm. So, how is that square off with, with your desire for sort of life extension uh, with your being a cryonicist and a transhumanist because many from the transhumanist and cryonicist society are very kind of health conscious and and for example the two best examples are of course probably natasha vita moore and max moore yeah who have been known for treating their bodies like temples for decades and who are very uh, specific and militant about both the their sports activities that they do as well as their nutrition. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do these things because they're fun, you know? <laughs> you mean <laughs> drinking be... and not exercising? <laughs> well, I mean, like, have, having a drink with friends, you know, I, I, I'd like a glass of whiskey every so often. I don't think I'd 
drink excessively or anything like that. It's just, it's just enjoyable, and I love the way it li- allows people to kind of open up and connect. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't have. I I, I wouldn't criticise the way um, Max and Natasha have, have chosen to live. And yeah, they're looking great. You know, they're 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 doing a very um, fine job with their regimes. And um, perhaps if I had more of that kind of willpower, I would do the same thing. Um, but I'm also I mean, there is there, there is a little bit of philosophy to my approach to health, and that's um, I'm interested in hormesis and the idea of kind of um, shocking your body. That some sometimes uh, doing things, uh, introducing toxins into your body, things like caffeine or uh, ones that we all know, but alcohol uh, can have some of the same kinds of effects. One of the more dramatic ones that I do is um, plunging myself into cold water a lot of the time and taking cold showers and things like that. I think that um, bodies don't actually like routine, is my feeling about it. Um, In evolutionary terms, bodies probably didn't experience that much routine. Uh, Days would have been, sometimes days would have been quite different. Shocks would have come along that their bodies would have had to adapt to. And I think that's a kind of interesting approach, is is, is actually taking quite a, a, not, not a, desperately unhealthy approach to your to, to, to looking after your body, but um, shocking it every so often, I think, um, along the lines of what uh, hormesis states, I think is, is, an, is an interesting approach. Um, I, I'm very lucky so far that I haven't had any problems with my health. I, I haven't even caught a, a cold for, I, I, I don't know, I guess like five or six years, I, I haven't even had a cold. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in good health. Yeah, it, it 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 might have to do something with your cold swimming sessions that you describe in the book too. So, and I personally, I exercise substantially. Uh, I'm a cyclist, but my two vices are, or my my main vices, I love food way too much. Uh, I just, I don't really drink at all, but I, I do love food way too much. And my particular, being Bulgarian by origin, my particular kind of weakness are pastries and breads. Mm. So <laughs> that's that's kind of my weakness, and and I do. Speaking of fears, too, by the way, I kind of really have issues with cold, cold water. Yeah. So, but I do know that it's it's uh, actually super healthy for you, actually, to shock your your body with cold showers, and or even if you can can get accustomed to swimming in the cold water as you do, that that's actually fantastic. Uh. Let me give you another quote and and you can perhaps discuss it. Uh, You say this, I am engaged in an experiment. I'm not so much trying to improve myself as seeking to find out what will happen. My tentative steps up to the edge of this ocean of chaos are as nothing compared to the total immersion of some. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that idea. I don't know. I I think it was to get across the idea that... that um, although it seems like a huge thing, cryonics isn't necessarily that much of a big deal. I mean, what do you have to do? You have to sign some paperwork, um, talk to your family, talk to your your partner, whatever. Um, get get some insurance in place to cover the thing. It doesn't seem when when you when you look at it in those terms, it's not that huge a deal. I think some other people, um, you know, people like uh, Max and Natasha Vitamore, um they are really living this thing. They're doing the whole exercise and, and diet regime. They're, they're spending all their lives in the kind of on, on, the, on the transhumanist project. To me, to me, that seems like total immersion, whereas I've um, focused in on one small slice of this and, 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 and that's kind of my, my main interest in it. Um, but yeah, it was really just to say, you don't have to think of this as a huge deal. You don't have to think of cryonics, like signing up for cryonics as the defining moment in your life, if you don't want to. I mean, you can you can just consider it uh, like writing a will or something like that. It's, 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 it's something that may seem quite odd at the time and, and may kind of perturb you a little bit and you'll have to think about death and what happens after you're gone. And, um, but it doesn't have to be a big deal beyond that. You can you can just do it and it's done. 
I mean, in my case, because I'm a writer, I can't do stuff like that. I can't just I can't just make the decision it's done. I want to examine it. I want to kind of go further into it. But not everybody has to do that. It's up to them. Uh, and, and let me uh, sort of speak a little bit more here about the the, the motivation again uh, that that's pushing you to do the, the kind of things and and actually why one kind of motivation. Uh, for example, to do cryonics is not much different than the sort of motivation to 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 lead a healthy lifestyle. Uh, let me let me just read one of my actually uh, kind of favorite uh, paragraphs uh, or or little arguments that you make in your book. Every time you pick up a tub of blueberries with the conviction that they are health promoting superfood or buy the latest probiotic yogurt expecting that it will improve your intestinal well-being, when you choose organic foods or kid yourself that homeopathic medicine has therapeutic merit, you are sending out a message that you want to live well and to be well. It says something about your view of your life that it is worth trying to stay as healthy as possible for as long as possible in order to enjoy it. Perhaps it also says something about your view of your death, that it can be pushed back little by little, blueberry by blueberry, even further into the future, ever further out of sight. If this is your view, then you may be at least partially right. Blueberries and yogurt, however, are not the interventions required. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, a bit a, a bit of humour creeping in there, I guess. I love uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So tell us a little bit more about that urge and, and why you think that blueberries and yogurt are not enough. Well, I you know I I love blueberries and yogurt. There's there's nothing wrong with with blueberries and yogurt, but 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 it. it it kind of it it seems odd that people will tinker with these tiny tiny um interventions in in their lives it, the, um it, the, there are people who who eat these things as part of a very balanced healthy lifestyle healthy diet that's fine if it's part of your regime but just mucking about with these with these tiny little things like people um they're marketed as superfoods um the, the the marketing hype calls them superfoods you know why bother playing about with these small things why not try to intervene uh a bit more radically than that you know if you really care about um staying around for as long as possible for your for 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 your um for your own well-being and for your loved one's well-being then why not be more experimental with it be more radical with it um why don't take the next logical step exactly exactly yeah yeah i totally agree with you that's why i kind of highlighted that paragraph and and i love the humor in it and and the kind of efficiency of the logic is just so effective in in my logic sort of framework anyway so i, I congratulate you for that that was beautifully thank you. written thank you um so let me ask you about, uh, we just uh, kind of touched on the sort of healthy foods and healthy habits and the unhealthy ones that you may have. But let me throw in a couple of other habits, uh, such as mindfulness and meditation and the importance of those. Yes. Yeah. You talk a lot about them in, in your book it's, uh, in some chapters. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that was about dealing with my own flaws and fears um initially it was just about trying to calm down um just feeling that i was far too much on the edge too much of the time um such a, a kind of nervous feel fearful person that it, it was really affecting my life and it was affecting my relationships with people and i thought i just, I just have to find a way of calming down and um I, I, I started mucking about with biofeedback stuff at first. I had one of these little um, galvanic skin response monitors and it plays a tone in your ear. And, and the more um, high-pitched the tone is, basically, the more stressed out you are. And you've got to try and um, change your galvanic skin response to lower the tone. A great little device. 
and um I just felt kind of silly playing with it though. I thought, why can't I just do this myself? Why uh, why do I need to um, monitor it kind of externally in this way? Now, I think it's incredibly useful biofeedback devices so that you can actually have some way of monitoring where your um, state of stress is. I think that's very useful. But at the same time, I do like simplicity and portability and you don't get more portable than just your own self. And um, so I thought, why don't I just try meditating and see if I can just control my breathing and, and, and just try and calm down a bit. And now that, that after a lot of struggles, it seemed to be working, but I also found that it, um, it really brought these, big questions of um, of self it, to the fore. Um, it, it was really about sort of just trying to let go of ego. And I'd, I'd been reading a lot of Derek Parfit stuff and I'd find that fascinating and it had a big influence on the book. And I thought, if I'm going to be able to write about this eloquently, then I have to start being able to feel it. I have to at least get a taste of what it's like to kind of lose my ego for a moment and so that was that was my route to that and as i've mentioned before it's 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 really hard to do and it's something that's, that's incredibly fleeting really difficult to hang on to but i also feel that it's something that we have to to um to push towards sam harris who i know is a meditator as well and he he writes about this quite a lot and um, he a, a piece I, I read about his, I read of his recently, it's called, um, it's in one of the edge.org compilation books and it's, it's called We Are Lost in Thought. And he is absolutely right. We're, we're, we're so busy with this um, internal dialogue all the time, this, this discursive thought that we miss so much about our world and, and we miss so many um, connections with other people and, um, because we're, we're because we're just running this internal narrative, running the story all the time. Now, I suppose it depends on the person. For some people, running that internal narrative um, doesn't seem to affect them too badly because their 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 narrative perhaps doesn't tie them in knots. It, it's not a debilitating thing. But for me, um, before I started doing the mindfulness stuff, I sometimes found my own internal narrative quite debilitating, just constantly making up these little stories inside my head um, just wasn't really good for my health. So I had to stop that. Yeah. And you speak about how mindfulness is both meditation, but also medication. Yes. Yes. And, and how it has like certain kinds of therapeutic effects, which I totally agree with you. And, and I, I also do try to practice it as often as I can. It's, yes. it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, DJ, let me let me share another thing that that kind of your writing reminded me to, and I don't know if you'd agree with me or not. And because it's been probably over twenty, maybe twenty four or five years since I I last read Marcel Proust, but your writing kind of reminded me of him, his writing a little bit. That kind of a stream of consciousness. Yeah. Do you think that's fair? That kind of a Proustian influence in you well i must admit i've only read proust second hand so i i can't really attest to that um i've read about proust work in other books but i've never been that inclined to read it myself that's pretty bad i guess and i i, I should get down to it but do you know actually what put me off reading proust was the references to it i found in other books made me think that just sounds so kind of knottedly self-indulgent. It just doesn't sound like my kind of thing at all. <laughs> so I've sort of held off from uh, reading Proust. But yeah, I guess I guess I need to get into that. So it's it's hard f for me to see an overlap there because it's not something that I've been directly influenced by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Because and again, I don't claim that to be accurate because it's been, as I said, long time since I read Proust last. But but it, it reminded me to, to his style a little bit. Yeah. So, DJ, we've been discussing uh, your latest book on cryonics. But let me ask you this then. What's next, what's next for DJ? What are you working on right now? Or what is, is there a next book coming? Uh, 
I haven't got anything lined up at the moment. Um, I've got I've got an author friend who writes very different stuff to me. He he writes uh, music biographies. His last one was about the Rolling Stones, and it was called um, Roller-esque. It's a kind of um, almost Dickensian style picaresque about the Rolling Stones. It's a sort of body romp about the the Rolling Stones, and I definitely recommend it, by the way. But um, he's he's a brilliant writer, and he's just got this unusual perspective and he was suggesting to me um why don't you write a transhumanist take on Grimm's fairy tales <laughs> and i said that's that's quite an interesting idea because i think he'd read um on my extra evolution blog i'd written a couple of um sort of neurophilosophical takes on the wizard of oz one about one about the Tin Man and one about the Scarecrow. And I think he'd been reading that and thinking. And also in, in the book, there's these kind of funny little fables. And I think reading those, he thought you could actually extend those out into a book. And that did get me thinking because it, I think it would just encourage me to get that sit down and get that done in a kind of bite-sized way. I could I could pick these off one at a time. And I also love... Um, the neuroscientist David Eagleman's book, Sum, 40 Tales of the Afterlives. I don't, don't know if you've read that, but I definitely recommend it. Um, so it's interesting. It's like you can, you can take any sort of little fable or story, uh, disassemble it and kind of break it down. Um, like the one I did with the, with the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz, um, the song says in, in, in the film, the musical of The Wizard of Oz, it says if I only had a brain. So I took that literally, because the grammar in it's not right. If I only had a brain, and I turned it into kind of brain in a vat scenario um, and kind of disassembled it that way. And the and the, the wizard is sort of remote controlling the scarecrow whose brain is actually in a vat in the wizard's lab. Um, and I love I loved that kind of idea, sort of playing with fables and things. And it would also probably be quite good therapy after writing something that like Frozen to Life, which can be quite heavy at times. I think the, the therapy might be interesting. Um, so, yeah, maybe you never know. I might try it out as a blog and see if see if people respond to it. So that that's that's one idea I have. But uh, I think it's a great idea. And if you start uh, kind of publishing them one sort of story at a time, you can uh, see the response you can get. You can do some editing, given that sort of feedback, uh, and, and then you can, in the end, uh, kind of combine them together. I think it's a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. We'll s yeah, we'll see. I'll, I'll try a few out, see how they work, and uh, maybe take it from there. So then we'll be looking out for those. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be any time soon, but yeah, I, I do mean to get my head down to it. I and mean, I'll still be doing some more serious writing on my, my Extra Evolution blog. Um, those essays can be quite involved sometimes. And, and I, I like doing that, taking a, an issue and really um, quite often you have philosophical issues and really kind of breaking them d down and, and picking away at them. But, but, you know, everybody needs some writing therapy as well, I think. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So, DJ, we've been talking with you for about an hour now. Let me ask you, what's the best place for people to sort of follow you up and find more about your work? Okay, well, there are a few places. I'm quite distributed. My main website is uh, djmclennan.com. They can find information there. Um, I, have a, I have a blog um, I try to write uh, every couple of months. It's quite long essay style pieces I tend to write on there. It's called extravolution.com. Um, my Twitter username is, is also extravolution. So you can find information about me there. Um, and I, I do write articles for, for, for other websites sometimes as well. And I do try to keep my, my own website fairly well up to date so the information about my latest writing is on there and of course there's links there so people can go and buy the book yeah absolutely I, I would say that uh, your book is, is fabulously written and I really enjoyed it um, what in your opinion is the best way to 
close our conversation today. What's the kind of parting message that you want to send out to our audience? Wow. Um, that's a really difficult question. I think enjoy life, play, experiment, and remember that everything is the way it is because it got that way. Very interesting. Very kind of Buddhist a little bit. I guess so. <laughs> I really like that, actually. And it, it kind of... Uh, it highlights the sort of the playfulness and the experimental nature of your book and, and your work. And, and I really appreciate that. And I, and I would actually uh, second that message because I think that it's really sad if people don't get to play in their lives and to experiment a little bit. I think those two things are vitally important for a good life and for a fulfilled life and for hopefully a growing and improving or sort of, uh, Pro progressing in some way or another kind of a, yeah. a life. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Nicola.